Unified networks are usually easy to set up and low maintenance, but every so often, small issues snowball into big headaches. In this video, I'll break down the five most common Unify problems that I normally run into with clients and show you the exact fixes that I implement to ensure that the network stays stable, fast, and predictable. So the first thing revolves around VLANs and generally how they are configured. So a lot of people configure a management VLAN, which is generally just designed for Unify hardware. So what generally happens is people come in and they configure the VLANs that they want to use. Then to follow best practices, they will use something like an ethernet port profile. Now an ethernet port profile is really just designed to be able to apply the port profile to multiple ports on a switch so that if they ever change, you only have to update it in one place. It's generally a best practice to use it. But what ends up happening is that when they configure the port profile for their management VLAN, they do not allow all. So there's two real ways that you could do this. The first way is that you could just allow tagging for all other VLANs. And then at that point, every new VLAN you create will automatically be able to be tagged because you are allowing everything. But what happens is that sometimes people set custom and then they'll come in and then they'll just select everything. So by default now, the management VLAN can technically tag all VLANs, but if you go in and add a new VLAN, then scroll all the way back down and you go to your management VLAN, you will see that the port profile did not pick it up. And the reason is because you selected custom in the first place. So generally selecting custom is a best practice to follow for your port profiles that are not management. You don't necessarily have to allow everything. I'm not suggesting you do, but what I'm suggesting is you assess the situation and determine if you should allow everything by default so you never have to worry about it, or if you are going to remember to go in if you selected custom and make sure that you select the new VLAN so that your switches and access points can tag that new VLAN, because generally what you're going to wanna to do is use that VLAN, but if downstream switches or access points can't tag it, it's not going to work. So this is probably a little more common than you think it is. And just remember this setup is very, very important. Now the next is going to be around IoT networks. And this is something that is an extremely common problem and it comes with IoT connectivity. Now there are certain people that have problems with certain devices and there are others that don't have problems with the same device. So you have to kind of look at your network and determine where you will or will not have problems. To give you some context, I have a lot of those ESP32 uh, smart home devices. Some of them are completely fine. Others always ran into connectivity issues. There was no rhyme or reason why. They were in the same parts, so it's not like it was an access point issue. It's just certain devices had trouble communicating. So when you configure an IoT Wi-Fi network, there are various ways to do it. And this is where the problems generally come in. So if you have something, we'll say like a Fire TV, an Amazon Fire TV, you're probably going to want it to communicate using five gigahertz because it's gonna provide a much faster experience. If you do not have this checked off, it'll still work, it'll use 2.4 gigahertz, but you might run into buffering issues and stuff like that that you wouldn't run into if it was using five gigahertz. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is because enhanced IoT connectivity is the problem that solved all of my IoT issues. But when you select it, it will uncheck everything except for 2.4 gigahertz. So what this is doing is it's basically setting very specific compatibility settings so that your IoT devices can easily communicate with the access points. And all of the problems that I did have, and I don't wanna make it sound like it was a lot, it was a few devices, but the few devices that had problems, as soon as I turned this on, those problems were gone. So what ends up happening is you kinda of have to make a choice. Are you gonna turn this on and hurt some of those devices that are using five gigahertz, or are you gonna keep it off and potentially run into connectivity issues with certain smart home devices, or we'll say IoT devices? And this is what I found to be the absolute best. In general, I do think it makes sense to have an IoT network 
where you leave the five gigahertz band on. I used to recommend turning this off. If you do not have it turned on, I would recommend you just turn on enhanced IoT connectivity because even if you're not experiencing problems, there's going to potentially come a time where you're going to introduce a new device that is going to have problems. So if you're not using five gigahertz, just turn this on, it will end up saving you. If you are using five gigahertz, my suggestion would be to check to see if any of your IoT devices are using five gigahertz. If they are, determine exactly what it is. If it's something like a Fire TV, again, turning this off is going to potentially cause problems on the performance side. So if you are in that camp, unfortunately, what I would recommend that you do is I'd recommend you create a second IoT network. I normally call it IoT Enhanced. I would then set a password and then I would turn enhanced IoT connectivity on. I know you'll have two SSIDs. I know it's not the best way of handling it, but you have to make a sacrifice one way or another. Either make the sacrifice on the performance side and turn this on for your IoT network if you are running into problems, or set up a second SSID for IoT Enhanced and then make sure this is on. But if you're running into IoT issues, this should solve them. It solved every one of my problems as well as multiple clients. So I think that you'll have good luck with this. Now, while we're on that topic of potentially adding a new SSID, let's say you didn't want to add a new SSID and let's say you had set up something like a security camera that's using Wi-Fi. You didn't want to set up a new SSID for that, but you have to because it needs to connect to the Wi-Fi. You can use a private pre-shared key. So I set this up on my home network with my IoT network. But if you come into this setting here, you'll see this private pre-shared key option. Now, the important point here is that unfortunately, you cannot use WPA3 security if you wanted to use this feature. So what you'd have to do is set this to WPA2. But then what it allows you to do is use a private pre-shared key. And as soon as you do, you'll see this option come up. And what this is saying now is that this SSID that you have that you're broadcasting can broadcast multiple VLANs. And then at that point, depending on the password that you put in, that will determine the exact network that that device will connect to. So if I come in and set a new network with a new password and I add it, what you'll see is that depending on the password the client uses, because remember, it's the same SSID, depending on what password the client uses, that is the VLAN they will be connected to. This is a huge benefit when you have, let's say an individual device that needs to connect and you really don't wanna set up an SSID for it. This will allow you to accomplish both of those without you have to sacrifice in creating a new SSID. Now, I know based on the last one that this kind of contradicts itself, that you don't want to create a new SSID, but in general, there are reasons you want to do that. For this, if you just have one device, you're literally creating an SSID for one device. So that's where this can come in handy. Now, the next is back to VLANs. So what ends up happening is people go in, they create their regular VLANs that they plan on using, and then they go in the future and then they create new ones. So we just showed how that can impact your management VLAN, but how can that impact other things? So inside of the cyber secure section, you're gonna see intrusion prevention. So this is intrusion detection and intrusion prevention. Notify is intrusion detection. Notify and block is intrusion detection and prevention. What ends up happening is people will turn on intrusion detection and intrusion prevention, create a new VLAN, and then forget to add the VLAN into this section here. So right now, the only VLANs intrusion detection and prevention are working on is management, trusted, and surveillance. Now, you can go in and you could add all the new ones, and they recommend that you keep it to less than three. It generally depends on the exact cloud gateway that you're using, so you might be able to use more if you have a higher-end device. This is Unify Express I'm using for testing. But the point is, if you came in and configure this in the past and then you go in and add a new VLAN, it's not going to be added by default. You always have to remember that you have to make sure the VLANs are tagged when you add it and intrusion detection and prevention is turned on because I've had a few clients come to me and say that they're having a few problems with intrusion detection and prevention and they don't think it's working. And then I come in here and I see that it's not even enabled. So make sure you enable it on new VLANs, assuming that you want to use it. 
Next up is firewall rules, and more importantly, not using firewall rules. So when you configure VLANs, a lot of people think that configuring VLANs is basically creating a segmented network. And it can be if when you configured your VLAN, you isolated the traffic. So if you check this off, firewall rules are automatically configured for that specific VLAN. Unfortunately though, a lot of people don't kind of go through the full process of creating their VLANs and then creating their firewall rules. Now, firewall rules used to be very difficult. It used to be having to understand the differences between LAN in, LAN out, LAN local, and internet in, etc. Now it's all zone-based and the zone-based firewall makes a lot of sense as soon as you understand how it works. So for most people, you really don't have to create more than we'll say one or two zones. And the way I have it set up here is the way I normally see people setting it up. And that is not the best way of doing it. So in general, the zone-based firewall is designed for you to create zones that VLANs are added to. So if you go in and you create a new VLAN, we created our test VLAN, what we would realistically have is rather than having one zone for all of our individual VLANs, we would have a zone that was called something like untrusted. And then the untrusted zone would have specific rules in terms of what it can access. So what you'll see here is the untrusted zone cannot access the internal zone. That's good, that's what we want. The untrusted zone also can access anything else. So just by creating that VLAN and adding it to this zone, you're immediately saying that the test VLAN that we just created cannot access any of our important systems. That is the benefit of the zone-based firewall. Now, firewall rules are really complicated to a lot of people. And if you're gonna be punching holes in the firewall, meaning that you're gonna be allowing access into an individual port on a specific device, like yeah, the firewall rules can get a little more complicated. But the average user is really just looking to isolate their IoT and their guest VLAN. And for that, you really don't have to do that much. You can come in here, configure one, maybe two zones, add your VLANs to those zones, validate that the firewall rules do exactly what you want, and then everything will be segmented. You won't have to worry. You'll have your untrusted devices split up from your trusted devices. If you have no idea what I'm saying or you're interested in implementing the firewall, I have a video that I'll leave a pop-up for now that walks you through the entire process. And if you aren't interested and you just want help doing that, I offer consulting services. I'm happy to help you with that. Now, there are obviously a lot more problems that you can run into, but these are five of the most common problems that I see for a lot of the clients that I've worked with. Now, for something like the private pre-shared key, it's not necessarily a problem, but clients have come to me and asked, what do I do? I have one device that I need to access my Wi-Fi. Do I put it on the IoT network? Do I not put it on the IoT network? That's a solution to a potential problem that can exist. And as soon as clients learn that that's an option, they love it. So I'm hoping you guys got some value out of this. If you have any common problems that you've run into that others would benefit from, please leave those in the comments. But other than that, if you made it this far, thank you very much for watching. I'll see you guys next time.